I have brilliant ideas for new projects every day. Unfortunately, I leave too many of these projects unfinished. Sometimes getting started isn't so hard, right? <laughs> How can I decide better what is worth starting? Is there a way to know if I'll lose interest in a couple of weeks? How many of you, when you talk, find yourself skipping topics that are related to something that you're reminded from and not that was not in the previous sentence? ADHD Rewired, episode 167. This is the show designed for those of us with really good intentions, but a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and speaker. The website is ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me tell you about this. You only have two chances left to save $400 on ADHD Rewired's next session of coaching and accountability groups. Registration interviews are on Thursday, May 11th and Thursday, May 18th. Registration interviews are by appointment only. Schedule yours at coachingrewired.com because this time, it's your time. So one of my big wins was I've always wanted to set up my self-hosted website and I've told myself a couple of hundred negative messages about how I can't do it, even though I can do it and I did it. I'm really excited. I've been writing for 10 days in a row. So that's been a huge win. And it's only because of these groups inspiring me to do my best. Increasing my time awareness without being stressed at that time is such a big win for me. I joined the group because I was diagnosed about 20 years ago. I've been diagnosed about a year old. And over that time, I've learned a lot. I've tried medication. I started medication and had some talk therapy, but my therapist was not that familiar with ADD. Tried individual therapy and I found this uh, the group was more effective. In this group, I learned that I, I can be very open and vulnerable with strangers. At the beginning, you were strangers. Here, I discovered Oh, so with my people, I can do it. It's liberating. It's like a rock taken from my back. I'm grateful for the way that um, everyone has shared and how comfortable it has made me in sharing. I discovered gratitude and the value of mindfulness. Um, I've started meditating. Oh, I discovered meditation. That was huge. Um, I discovered the value in tracking tasks, the value of study hall. And I know how to organize and clean my home thanks to the study hall. And I know you say this in all your podcasts, Eric, but the value of just getting started. What I learned in the course of this group is that change comes much more fluidly with less resistance and more acceptance of self. And Eric, I stumbled on your podcast. It was invaluable. And then started hearing about this in terms of helping lead me to on a path towards some solutions. Give me some tools as well as a community of people who were dealing with similar or related issues. My main goal is to be a better mom, wife, employee. And at the time, I didn't realize, but just to be a better me. I joined the group because I decided it was time to bring my ADHD out of the closet. It's nice to have a place where people can get together and um, chat about these things. To be able to share these struggles, not feeling like you're alone in dealing with them is sort of like the core value of the group. Join us for ADHD Rewired's 10th season of coaching and accountability groups beginning August 21st, 2017 through October 27th. Register now to secure your spot and save $400. You only have two days to register early, May 11th and May 18th, and it's by appointment only. Go to coachingrewired.com to schedule your registration interview today. That's coachingrewired.com. It's the second Tuesday of the month, so if you're catching this early enough on the same day this came out, you can join me today for a live Q&A, along with Ryan McRae, the ADHD nerd. 
We're doing it at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. That's 10.30 Pacific, 1.30 Eastern. Just go to erictibbers.com slash events to register. And yes, today's episode is the recording of last month's live Q&A. So when you see a live Q&A episode show up in your feed, there's a good chance there's a live Q&A that day. Just go to erictibbers.com slash events to register. You can join us by audio or video. Just make sure you have headphones and are in a quiet location with good internet. Otherwise, you can submit your questions by text during the Q&A or when you register. And we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. There's a link in the show notes or just go to erictibbers.com slash events. We'll see you there. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's show is our monthly live Q&A. So I want to welcome everybody who is here live and uh, anyone who submitted a question ahead of time. Right now we have uh, 20 people who are joining us here live. As a reminder, we do this every second Tuesday of the month at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, And you can always go to erictivers.com slash events to register. Uh, So today, joining me, uh, filling in for uh, Nisha Subramanian, who is right now on on the other side. She's basically as far away from me as she possibly can get on this planet. Uh, she's in Australia right now visiting her sister. Um, so Laura Curvin is our sort of guest co-host uh, who has had about 20 minutes of experience on the back end of Zoom. Um, so it will probably show and we're okay with that. So um, Laura, first of all, thank you for, for um, volunteering to jump in here and um, give everyone just the, the 30 seconds. Like, who are you? So I'm Laura Curvin. I live in the Pacific Northwest in Twin Peaks land, uh, about 45 minutes outside of Seattle. And I have a background in instructional design and adult learning. So it seems like a good fit to be here, but um, I'm a little shaky on the technicality. So I appreciate everyone's patience in advance. Thank you. Awesome. And as, as we know here on ADHD Rewired, we embrace imperfection. Uh, so here we go. Let's start off uh, with a question that was submitted uh, ahead of time. Uh, so Laura, these are the questions that I shared with you ahead of time. So what was that, that first question that we said we wanted to answer? So the first question is from someone named GERP, <laughs> or maybe not technically named GERP. And GERP wants to know, what are the best morning routines to set yourself up for a productive day? Great question. So I think what the question really is asking is what are the best morning sort of behaviors? Because we want to, you know, this idea of getting routines um, is sort of this holy grail in a sense of, of ADHD because when we have something that is a well-established routine, we are not having to sort of tax our executive functioning as much because we can sort of do things without having to think about it as often. So if we're thinking about setting routines as, okay, so we want to sort of create this ideal framework that will hopefully become a routine. But so what are the habits that are part of, of a successful routine? Um, you know, with, with everything, there's no single answer that is going to say, well, if you do these things, Three simple, simple things. This will work for you because um, everybody is different. For me, I know that, you know, making sure I've reviewed my plan for the day, making sure I've had uh, a good sort of high protein breakfast, um, having time for exercise. Um, sort of those are the, the things that are sort of the, I think that the cornerstones are the most Sort of keystone things that help us sort of get get off to the, a, a good day, um, and if we back up even more from there, um, probably the best thing we can do for today happens the night before, and that's to make sure that we're getting enough sleep. Um, you know, it's it's getting enough sleep makes a difference uh, between us being able to to do that maybe important task, I think that's boring but important, with relative ease and for that task being really challenging, if not seemingly impossible to do. Um, so really just being sort of clear and you know not having too many decisions um, 
that that you have to be able to make. You know, for me, I basically alternate between two different uh, things that I have for breakfast, um, and I just alternate days. So it's not like, hmm, what do I have to have for breakfast today? Huh? Do I want this? Do I want that? It's like, no, I I, I decide what I want as part of my routine. Um, so I go between every other day. It's either a a uh, protein shake day or a high protein oatmeal and nuts and berries day. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, even things like, I mean, I, I love the idea of uh, that, that they use on the, the minimalist uh, podcast uh, to talk about having a uniform or it's like, we're the same thing. So you don't have to make decisions. So doing the same thing in the same way, in the same order um, really does help our brain uh, use less executive function. So it's a great question and I appreciate the question. All right. So Laura, what, uh, what question do we have next? Let's, let's maybe hop over to the Q and a here. So, uh, we've got a question from Amanda and she is struggling with how to track goals, projects, and short-term tasks at work, as well as in her personal life tactics for one setting don't tend to work in the other environment. Great question. Okay, and uh, I'm not sure if Amanda, if, she, if you're wanting to come on and ask live, and if so, uh, let us know. You can actually me- message Laura on the chat. Um, just so or raise know. your hand, whichever. I don't think we went over that feature, the, the raise a hand function um, that's there somewhere on, a, on your screen. <laughs> If, yeah, hit I a think button. If, Some of you found it. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so she can't. Okay, okay. so um, Amanda's question has to do with goal tracking. So, you know, so many people will ask me, what is the the sort of best tool to use? Um, and what I want to encourage you to really think about is to to try to get away from this question. The the reason being is because we get bored of tools, and so we can have the best tool like for this week, you know, or this month, um, but our, one, our context will change, so our needs will, will change. And, and what I mean by that, so like, I love the idea of being able to use a paper calendar, but now that I w- really have, um, I'm working more with a team, like that's not uh, ideal for me. You know, so having an online calendar, which also integrates with a lot of my scheduling things, like that's, I need that. All right, so it's really thinking, you know, what are the behaviors associated with this? So, you know, sort of going back to um, our, our first question about habits, and thinking about the, the behaviors associated with it. So there's there's not necessarily this tool, but if you have, it could be a notebook, it could be a you know, piece of paper, it could be a whiteboard. The the key is, do you have those behaviors around that, those places where you capture what you need to do, both uh, for the day, for the week, for the month and beyond? And how often are you revisiting those things? And sort of creating a rule set around what you are um, uh, where you're capturing things. So if let's say you're using a notebook today or this week, having a sort of a rule says, okay, here's where I add these things and here's where I update them. Um, you know, one of the things that I do in my coaching groups is we do is called the, the 20 by five by five challenge. And it has to do with planning. It's a very behavioral, behaviorally focused challenge where, um, the, so the 20 is 20 minutes. So 20 minutes in the morning spent planning. Uh, the five by five, where you are um, spending five, at least uh, checking in and reviewing or processing what you planned in the morning, um, at least five times a day and doing that five days in a row. Okay. Now, if you do it four times, like that's fine. Um, you know, it's it's the idea of frequent processing, frequent checking back in um, with what your intentions are. Now, for part of it, this question has to do with uh, projects and, and goals. You know, so if you have a big sort of multi-part project, you may want to have one specific sort of a, whether it's a, a spreadsheet, if you're a spreadsheet person, a mind map, if you're a mind map person, I personally use um um, Asana. Um, I, I am, I'm not like, I don't love Asana. It's functional for me though. It works well enough. Like there are certain things that I wish I could do with it that I can't. Um, 
But so I have certain projects uh, set up there, but I also use my Asana and I create um, these sort of boards and columns. So I have on my columns, um, it's, and this is how I sort of set up my um, my day and week. And I did a workshop on this a couple of weeks ago. Where I'll have one column, it's, here's what I wanna get done today. I have another one for this week. I have another column for uh, next week. I have another column for this month, another column for next month. And the, the nice things about these columns is that you sort of have like these digital sort of they look like note cards um, or you could slide them back and forth between these columns. And I do that frequently. So I'll have on my day um, uh, like five things that I think that I can get done today. And as the days get going through and I'm getting towards the end of the day, I realize that, OK, I didn't get to two of those things. So I'll throw those. I might throw those back to the this week column. So just because you said that you want to get something done this week doesn't mean it necessarily has to get done this week. Um, so it's really, you have to be clear about are, are there specific sort of urgent deadlines that need to get done. And then as far as like a specific goal, if it's a personal goal, because you had a question about how do you track in your personal life? I love the use of using like a star chart. Um, you know, star charts aren't just for kids. Um, and it's just basically, it's a, it's a way to track what you're doing. Now, if you know the the one of the I think biggest mistakes that I see people make when when uh, beginning to sort of track goals is they set out this goal that is a, this idealized version of yourself that you have never ever been at, um, and so like the first week that you didn't hit that, you're already going to feel like oh I failed. So you know, goal setting doesn't work for me because that didn't work out so well, and. So what I would what I would encourage you to do is then sort of pull back and say, all right, what am I doing now? What would be an improvement next week or today? And looking at it in a very numerical way. So let's say you're your person you have a personal goal for exercise and you haven't been exercising at all. Um, exercising one time for five minutes in the next week would be an improvement. Then the following week, improve from there, increase from there, and so on and so on and so on. The smaller steps you take most often is going to, for the long run, lead to the greatest uh, and, and biggest change with the biggest impact. I hope that that answered that goal. So, the, you know, the, the gist of it or that question, the, the gist of it is that it is absolutely a behaviorally a behavioral focus on how do we uh, do those things. Hey, Eric, I just want to add that I can attest to your 20 by 5 by 5 tactic. It did I mean, I had breakthroughs with that experiment. It was fantastic. And I also have a question that relates to this. So you set at the top of your answer, you um, made the point that there's no one size fits all single silver bullet. So I know that you have to accept that your uh, methods and processes occasionally have to be refined and revisited. They mm -hmm. don't work forever. So what are some signs that it's time to maybe refine your, your system? Things need some, some updating. Um, I think one, well, there's a lot of ways I can answer this question. Uh, one is, are you just like not looking at it? Right. But I think that if you have historically, uh, or in at least the recent past, and you can define that however you want to, if that's in the last six months, year, two years, that's even really good about using a certain sort of tool or system. And you just notice that you haven't been using it. Like that might be a good sort of a uh, um, disengaging. Yeah. You're disengaging from it. And mm -hmm. over the last, I think since I started this podcast uh, just over three years ago now, I think that's happened to me twice where I, uh -huh. <laughs> well, where like I didn't like look at my clock wow. because I used to use like a, I used to use a notebook that I, I created. It's sort of similar. It uses sort of some concept of concepts of bullet journaling, um, but then also some of the concepts that I mentioned before, where I have like my my day, my week, and then um, I use these readhesible tabs so I can move the tabs from week to week. And I was using that for probably close to two years, but there was at least twice that I went like like two or three weeks where I didn't even open it once. Right? I know. Right. Um, and one of the times that that happened, I was like, all right, I got to get into finding a new system. I started like, you know, doing the whole like app store thing that I've, you know, I've done for so long. And, you know, I've, I've purchased and downloaded and used for short periods of time. I mean, I'm, 
hundreds of apps productivity Same. related. Same. Uh, Analysis and, paralysis. Right. And I think the, the question to always ask yourself is, am I now seeking a new tool? Um, is it really the tool or is this now like the 15th to-do list app that you are now looking for in a, you know, in a 10 week period or in a, even in a one year period? Because if that's the case, I would suggest it. Maybe it's not the app. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think sometimes we think it is and like we, we don't realize that like, oh, look, I'm putting way too much on my to do list or I'm not I'm not breaking down or writing the, my to do's in a way that's actually a to do and not a project. It's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is that they have this to do on their to do list. But like, that's not a to do item. Like that's a project that probably has right. hundreds of steps involved. Right. In right. 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 And Pure so, world hunger. That's a <laughs> project. Can't do it in one sitting. Right. I, I wonder how many people right now, either watching live or listening, have on their uh, on their to do list. Get organized. Yeah. Right. That's like, fast. like that's not a to do item. Like that. That's, that, a that's goal. like a two year <laughs> undertaking of like of like you have like books to read and probably coaches to hire and professional services to like. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. Yeah. And. You know, and I know this because I used to have get organized on my to-do list. And it's like, well, what does that actually mean? You know, right. and What's it's like. What's the first step? How do I break this down into a one action step that I can complete in one sitting? Right. And like, for me, like I'm looking at my, my, my office right now, which is not organized. And I, so I might look around and say, okay, you know, move these two boxes that have been sitting on the floor for <laughs> the last month. Like the best way to be would be move these two boxes to the specific location that I want them to go to. Right. That is a, a concrete uh, uh, action step that we can cross off and we know what done looks like. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Thank you. We have lots more questions. Yeah. Next question. Let's, let's, uh, let's try to fly through some of these. Okay. So um, here's one I can relate to. This person often finds, I'm just going to read it in their voice. I often find myself procrastinating on tasks that are very important, Whew. like completing client work on time. And according to contract, the longer I put these tasks off, the deeper I repress them and the outcomes are generally disastrous. It's classic avoidance, but to the nth power. I've tried most of the tricks in the book, and so I'm open to strategies normally only reserved for only the most accomplished of procrastinators. I'm an accomplished procrastinator. I can relate. <laughs> oh, and I, I completely empathize and relate with with this. Um, you know, so the the things that take longer. Uh, so a couple of things on this. I think a part of this is a structural. Um, like setting up your system and workflow type of thing, right? So looking at, there's sort of this rule guideline that, that I found to be helpful and I try to follow. I don't always, um, you know, it's some, one of these lessons where it's like, oh yeah, that's that's a lesson I've now learned for the, you know, 18th time to um, under promise and over deliver. So if you're, if you say, okay, I can, I for, for sure in your mind, that I can absolutely get this done by say May 1st. Okay. Tell your client like a month later than what you are really sure in your mind. Cause think about how often are we really sure that that task is going to take us five minutes or an hour? How often does it actually take us that amount of time? Right. So what, so from a, 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 from the onset sort of perspective, um, sort of, Telling your client it will take uh, however long you think it will, tell them much longer and don't share with them that that gap that you have in your head and what you're telling them. Because often what will happen is it's going to be much closer than you actually realized. I've also found that, just, I mean, I don't know what your line of work is, but the more you like share that you're behind on something, uh, just people would rather have updates, even if it's five updates to tell them that that you're behind schedule. Um, people want to be in the know. People want to to just be updated on stuff. Um, and you know, it's I struggle with that one too. So it's because I I don't want to disappoint someone by saying, oh, this thing is taking longer. So, but anytime I do share that with someone, like the results are never bad. Like it's it's 
and, you know, often I'm, I, I look at the response that I get and, um, you know, my, my initial thought is, well, that wasn't so bad. And, you know, I, that was actually pretty painless. Um, so and the other thing, if this is put a part of your day to day, like ongoing, um, uh, an ongoing issue, like here, a much bigger question to ask yourself is, am I in the right line of work? And I know that's, that's never an easy question, but that also, you know, often the, the hard thing and the right thing are often the same thing. Um, so when we're looking at if you're, if the majority of your work is deadline driven, contract based, and you're frequently behind, um, it might be time to re- kind of re- see if there's a way to renegotiate uh, uh, either what you're doing, the types of, of tasks you're doing, um, and are there things that you can let go of? Um, you know, the power of saying no is one of the best things you can do to really uh, uh, supercharge your productivity. Um, you know, I remember when I first started my practice, uh, my, my therapy practice, and people would ask me to write reports, and I would, you know, initially I'd said yes because I was like, well, I'm a therapist, I should, you know, write reports for people. That's because well, that's what people do, right? And I kind of got to this point where I'm like, I'm a painfully slow writer. I do not like doing that. And so now from the get-go, when, when a client will work with me, if they're looking for like a, a diagnostic report, um, I'll, refer, I'll just refer them out. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't I, I do not do that. I, what I say is I charge by the hour and I'm a really slow writer. Um, and so it's like just being okay with with sharing what you are not, uh, what you don't want to do, um, even if you think that it's something that you should be doing. Okay. Um, thank you for for that question. What is our next uh, our next question here? So, um, Aline, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sorry. Every time I, I say Aline's name, I always wonder the same thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Aline says, "I have brilliant ideas for new projects every day. Also, can relate. Unfortunately, I leave too many of these projects unfinished." Sometimes getting started isn't so hard, right? (laughs) Getting started can be easy and finishing can be harder. Um, How can I decide better what is worth starting? Is there a way to know if I'll lose interest in a couple of weeks? Okay, great, great question. One, I would say when I hear that you're, you're like coming up with new projects, ideas every day, um, right there is like, that's just like, like, that's like the ADHD storm right there. It's like, it's great to come up with ideas, but I think that coming up with ideas and then starting on those ideas, like if you're talking about projects on the same day is like the perfect recipe for having way too much on your plate. Right. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, I think it was David Allen, it was either David Allen or Stephen Covey that said, it's not that we have, uh, too much to do. It's that we have too many things that we haven't finished. Right. Um, and and so I think that's really true in, in this situation. Um, when I'm thinking about projects, I'm being very intentional about the projects that I that I sort of think about taking on. Um, so it's, the idea is if I, I might look at it either once a month or once a quarter. Um, but really, like when I'm doing my deep work, my deep planning, um, I'm really looking at it from the year to what projects do I want to take on you know, this year. And then every quarter and month, I kind of revisit that to see, you know, are these project ideas still relevant to me? Because um, if you're thinking about different projects every day, I would say that those are more tasks. Those aren't projects. Projects are things that you can't do in a day, typically speaking. You don't want to, I'm not saying to, to not capture the, the great ideas. Like we, we know like having great ideas is it's awesome. I think it's one of the, uh, uh, one of the, the associated uh, features that I think is, um, can be a strength with, with ADHD. Um, but we can't act on every good idea and we definitely shouldn't act on every great idea right in that moment, right? Put it somewhere, put it in that place of great ideas. And then whether it's weekly, monthly or quarterly, spend a good chunk of time kind of processing those ideas and say, you know, is, does, does this still make sense to me? Is this aligned with, with a bigger purpose of like, what are my primary goals for the year? Um, so I think that that, uh, you know, really looking at what's your ultimate why and is it aligned with what you are trying to do? Um, I think that is really significant, but coming up with new projects and deciding each day, um, yeah, that's, uh, I just don't know how well that's going to work out because I've been there and I've done that. And that's, you know, I think for a lot of us who 
uh, it went from a place from really struggling and being overwhelmed to, you know, kind of adulting like a somewhat functional human being. Um, you know, it, it's, um, I think we made that shift from recognizing that we can't just start pro- new projects every day. So, um, Eric, can I, I would like to add that one of the things that I learned um, during our uh, accountability group um, is the defer three months. Mm-hmm. So during my monthly ish review of open projects, um, I always have a category that I, that's kind of where I park those, you know, I've got another great idea. I have another creative idea for a business that is highly unlikely I'll ever start, but just in case I won the lottery, I want to put it somewhere. So I know I can always find that list and my check this list in three months uh, column of my map. So that's something else that you can consider doing, Aline. Yeah. I mean, and what, what uh, Laura, what you just mentioned is really the heart of it's about process and processing your process, right? So it's like, here's the, here's the, the, the list of things that I, the ideas that I have and how often do you come back to those, to review those, to, to visit those. That's probably one of the most important pieces because like capturing things is great, but it's, if you don't like come back to it, it just becomes clutter, right? Um, like the processing and, and the coming up with the ideas, that's the fun part, the processing mm-hmm. and then making that decision about what you're going to do this month or this quarter or even this week. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that's that's a little harder, right? I mean, that's where actually the work comes in, right? right. And I think having the, the also, I used to, I remember when I uh, first was diagnosed with ADHD and the, for the first, you know, handful of years, one of the, my, my sort of pet nicknames for ADHD was the the like 95% disorder because I would like do something to the 95% point and then I like wouldn't finish it. Right. And, and so I think being aware of that, um, you know, so I, yeah, I say starting is the hardest part, but so is finishing and sort of be aware that, okay, like the, fin- the crossing the finish line of a project is, um, it can be a beast. Right. And like, just be like aware that like, it's a big challenge. Like you've done so much of it. you've done 95%, but sometimes that final 5% almost sometimes emotionally and how much sort of focus to detail is required for that final 5%. So just sort of acknowledge that not all percents are created equal. That makes sense coming from my, you know, cause I'm not a math person. So not all percents. And Aline is a math person. I actually know that. So she's probably, I'm hoping she's cringing. That. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. The traumatizer. I want to just jump in really quickly to say uh, that, um, uh, again, we do this every second Tuesday of the of the month at 1230. Um, but what we're going to do really quickly is we are going to uh, jump to take a quick break and we'll be right back um, to answer more of your questions. I have a secret. It's actually a secret about the ADHD rewired community. It's a secret that affects anyone who is in the community, but it especially affects anyone who has requested to join our community or has been planning on joining our community. On May 2nd, 2017, the ADHD Rewired community on Facebook has changed to a secret group. So if you search for it on Facebook, you're not going to find it. One of the special things about our online community is that we've taken time and care to screen everyone who comes into the community. But our current process is not working. We've all probably heard Einstein's definition of insanity, you know, keep trying the same thing over and over again and expect different results. So if you're one of the 500 plus individuals whose acceptance into our group is still pending, First, I want to thank you for your patience and your understanding, but I'm waving the white flag on this request queue. Despite our best efforts to keep up with the requests and screen everyone, too many people have not responded to our messages. Part of this is because of Facebook's filters and how they deal with messages from people you're not connected with. But we believe the bigger issue is that many of these people who have requested to join our community 
found us just by searching for ADHD and are not listeners of the podcast. So if you've been stuck in the queue or want to join our free and now secret Facebook community, go to ericktivers.com slash community or go to ADHDrewired.com to click the link or button that I still need to make that will say something about joining the community. And that will take you to the application that I haven't finished yet. But because I do really well with accountability, I would say there's a 94.2% chance that it'll be done by the time this airs. And if it's not, I'll tell you about it next week. Go to ericktavers.com slash community. That'll be the direct link that will hopefully be up by the time this airs. Fill out the application that we'll have there, but as much detail as you can. And uh, we will go through that on a weekly basis. To the 500 of you who are uh, still in the queue, sorry, we're about to clear the queue. I just wanted to let you know. But please, we want you to be in our community. Go to our website, fill out our application, and join us. Hey there, ADHD Rewired listeners. The 10th season of the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group doesn't start until August 21st, but early registration started last Thursday, and the only of two Thursdays left. Thursday, May 11th, and Thursday, May 18th. Why Thursdays? Well, that just happens to work in my schedule. So if it works in yours, secure your spot and get $400 off our next coaching and accountability group. Sign up early, secure your spot, and save. These groups will fill up. Don't get stuck on the wait list. Go to coachingrewired.com to secure your registration and screening call today. That's coachingrewired.com. All right, we are back. And all right, we are going to answer some more of your questions. Um, we have our next question is. So there are some options. I think you should look through them because I don't want to tee up. Karen, do you want to yeah. join us live and ask your question? Are you able to do that? Um, and just a reminder to everyone, if you join us a little bit late, um, that if you have a question, please use the Q&A function so we can actually see the question, the chat question. I'm not really watching. Um, and it's just hard to, to track information that way. Uh, so please, if you posted a question in the chat, just copy and paste it over to the Q&A. So our next question, do we have that? Um, if Karen, I'm checking to see if Karen can, can join us. Uh... And oh, Karen, I think said earlier in the, the chat that I that I said that I wasn't looking at um, that uh, she would join us live. So let's. Uh, oh, cool. Do you remember how to promote her as a panelist? All right, all right, everybody. This is the test. I'm gonna. I oh, do remember. Man. I do remember. Here I go. <laughs> there you go. Karen is a panelist now. All right, here she comes. All right, hi, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, guys. It says I'm unmuted. I, I unmuted you. I can hear you. Okay. I didn't know if you could hear me. Yes. Okay. All right. What's Here, your question? Well, this is sort of a, a statement. Um, I'm a speech pathologist by training. Okay. And I think that we're missing the whole ballpark on ADD. Uh, and I think that's because we haven't been involved in the research. And let me state that uh, there's a. And when you say the, we, you're talking about like speech paths, speech paths, and all the people that are in the area of language mm -hmm. and neuroscience making the connection between this one part of the brain that works um, without much difficulty in the neurotypical brain, and for us, it's off. So. That area is called auditory association, and you probably know that in your profession. You know, we use auditory association um, to help improve our memory. Like, well, you and and I, I think everybody knows this. You know, you'll think of something that's associated uh, with something, and that'll help you remember. The point that I want to get to, and I want feedback on from the group, is that the more I've started to work with adults over the years, and now I'm actually clinically taking notes when I talk to ADD adults, 
I don't know if you notice this. I do this, but we'll skip topics uh, quickly mm -hmm. due to the area of the brain that's associated in that part of the brain um, with another topic. Okay. And somehow the whole trend of our research seems to think that we're scattered. We're um, using uh, impulse control, I, I don't think that's true. I think that our wiring goes up to this auditory uh, association part of the brain in the Warnicke's area of the brain, I think it is, and we just work through association. So uh, am I going too fast here? No, I'm uh, I'm trying to hold on to the background information so I can oh, okay. uh, use it so in context to answer that, the question. That being said, how many of, this is going to go on to a new thing. Here's a question for the group, and it is related. How many of you talk, when you talk, find yourself skipping topics that are related to something that you're reminded from and not that was not in the previous sentence? That's one thing I want so, curious uh, about. If, if you guys relate to that, uh, just do a quick raise of hands, and then so we can, I can then share uh, with listeners how many people have raised their hands. All right, we have 10, we have 90 people in here right now. So 10 people have raised their hands and nine probably aren't paying attention at the moment. Um, I'm trying. I just forgot how. <laughs> Consider it another hand. Well, right. And, and I think that, that you know, um, the, sort of the thinking sort of styles of individuals with ADHD is very relational um, mm -hmm. versus, versus linear. But I think the challenge is prioritizing relative information in real time is sort of that social mm -hmm. executive function right mm -hmm. um it's we have this thing that reminds us of this other thing and it seems relevant in the conversation but you know our the, the our communication partner might not necessarily follow that um mm -hmm. now and, and i see this all the time people with adhd typically can follow those sort of uh those I call them mind map conversations, you know, or these relational topics connect, not necessarily in a linear way. Um, but for, for some people, they can follow that wonderfully. For other people, it's very disorienting. Well, yes. And, and, and even though I may be an expert in this area, just because I've done the schooling, I still struggle with it every day. I have to actually, I used to really annoy the hell out of people. And now I have to really stay focused. Okay. The, the other uh, um, thing I just wondered if the group, if my tribe could uh, just notice this and maybe next time, next month, whenever, when you're doing a task, how many times they, they used to say this shiny object. Yep. Okay. How much of that is really an association task? I, I want to just look at paradigms that we can kind of look at this. Does it make sense? And then develop a clear hypothesis because I've gone through the literature and there's nothing in the area on adults and association. In but, you know, in, in, in Karen, you mentioned that uh, you think that, that um, the profession is looking at it wrong because they look at it from the, the sense of, of impulse control. But in a sense, association, when your task, if you, if you're working on uh, say task mm -hmm. a, right. Mm -hmm. And while you're working on task a, like, sure, there are associated things, but if those associated things aren't directly related to task A, like that is um, uh, uh, impulse control or, or inhibitory control, I'm um, not working right, right? Because if, if exactly. you know what I mean, so it's it's fine that we have that that thought that that enters into our mind, but what happens is that thought is given the same priority as the actual task, which is really annoying, right? Well that's what I'm saying. And I think it's because the wiring goes to the auditory area of the brain that's associated is much stronger for auditory association. I think the wiring's off there. That's what I'm speculating. That's my hypothesis. And, uh, and I think they're, you know, Karen, looking at it, if you could sort of zoom back from just auditory, but look at it from more, more of a, a global picture of sensory input, right? So well, like our, our brain, like whatever is getting the, uh, any like, input and in, in any sensory channel like now our brain like that's on equal playing field with, with whatever we're working on i did a uh, a video a while back um that i think i still have in my uh, autoresponder series so if you're on my email list you'll, you'll get it um or it shows uh the analogy of of attention and adhd very similar to like a plasma ball 
where if you put your fing- like one finger on the plasma ball, most of your attention goes to that area, right? But then if you put another finger on the plasma ball, that could be an unrelated task. Now it's getting the equal amount of attention between the two um, uh, sort of sources of input. Right. And that's, I think, what happens. So whether it's, it's auditory, whether it's visual, whether it's uh, I mean, for me, like when I, when I'm sick, I am I'm like the worst sick person because it's all I can, like focus on is not feeling well. It's like and I do think that that that's a um, likely to be in a, an ADHD related uh, symptom because it has to do with the, our ability to regulate our attention. That means mm-hmm. like, we're working on a specific task our regulatory system is supposed to are the inhibitory network of our brain that handles our attention and our t- attention is not just focus. Our inhibitory, our, our attention network deals with focus, but it also deals with inhibition. It deals with task shifting, um, you know, and so our, our brain is supposed to sort of have these sort of like bodyguards, right? right. Of the stuff that's not related to the task at hand, except our, our, the, those bodyguards are, they're jokers, right? And they keep distracting us and they keep getting our attention when they're supposed to be blocking the, the irrelevant uh, input um, that, uh, that we get from, from all other sources. And I think that, um, so where mindfulness is, I think really important because it allows us to, to sort of pause and say, okay, is this what I want to be doing right now? And so like, in conversation, he, having like a notepad and we can just sort of write a note, um, one word that sort of keeps you on track of what you are wanting to, like what the topic is, um, can be very helpful. And I, uh, and I do that often. So Karen, thank you. I want to I want to get to other questions. We have a bunch of other questions that we don't have a bunch of time left. Can I just conclude on one thought? You have, you have oh, 10 seconds. Group? Yeah, no, nope, I'm not going to go online. I just want to challenge the group to do this. If you can record yourself speaking in a conversational situation and then just take a look at that. And I'd love to know the feedback so that you're monitoring yourself. And how many times did you get off topic? Maybe record it on a phone or record it somewhere else that's what i'd like to start looking at eric and and the group if any of you have any ideas and then we can deal with that later thank you thank you so much karen all right let's go to our next question so i am i there's a quick follow-up question i think it's related to this topic what do you mean by an association task a clarifying question from missy okay so uh, my I would imagine what what that means. So let's say you're thinking about um, are you you're about to go out to the store to do a specific errand, and then now you're out there driving. Oh yeah, I got to do this other thing too. Um, uh, so it's like a, it's a related, related, but not necessarily the task at hand. Um, or you're going to on your computer to look for a certain file, then you say, "Oh, I need to clean up uh, this folder," and now you're doing that. I think probably the the um, uh, almost the um, the um, we we all have had that experience if we're going to clean up our room, right? And then the next thing we know, we're alphabetizing our our like book or CD collection by like by genre or color or like where we sort of get it's related, but that it wasn't the task at hand. Right. And then it's two in the morning. Yep. So, okay. Um, hopefully that helps uh, Missy to ping us if, if you want to get into more clarification there. So we have a question in the Q and A Q from Kim. Um, and she says the, the final five project of the project of design. Kim's a he. Hey, Kim. Kim, I'm sorry. I'm (laughs) sorry, Kim. I I apologize. Uh, I should just be more generic with my pronouns in general. Kind of like separation anxiety. Like finishing is never good enough. Like leaving a friend, it is harder to finish the design with clients I like the most. Mm. So the question is, how do I address that for myself? What are some ways of getting through that final five of a project finishing the next hardest part kim do you want to join us and are you in a place where you can do that okay i see a hand raised okay let's unmute kim because it makes for better audio and all right hey kim hi there how are Um, you good Uh, by the way just so you know uh eric and i visited last week and this is the result here and so he's pointing to a band-aid that's on his forehead oh no nice Nice, nice spider up, bite, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And and the bruise, by the way. I don't know if you saw the bruise things. So. Oh no, I didn't see the bruise. Yeah, there you go. All right. So 
final five, you're talking about that final 5% of a project. Um, and the hardest part being like, if it's a project that you like. Yeah. So the challenge is, is I'll do a fairly complex design. I've got it all thought out. And I think so many of us really kind of go through these things where we'll, we will have all the elements put together. I mean, each part of the project and some of the projects I'm doing are fairly complex. So I'm in the, uh, landscape design projects and they're in my world, uh, money equates to size. So they're in the, I don't know, anywhere from 60 to hundred, 120,000 dollar projects. And so you got lots of different elements, choices, selections, materials, uh, irrigation, lighting. And, you know, I just, got all ready to go and it's going to be ready tomorrow. It's next week. And I mean, it's just that last finishing, but I started finding that really what I'm almost doing is not, um, I don't want to finish it. It's not that I'm being distracted, but rather I'm just don't want to. Yes. You don't want to let it go. I don't want to let it go. That's right. So do you think it's because like, because part of what you said is that you really just like working with this particular client. Yeah, I found that's to be really true. The, the, my favorite clients are actually the ones that I want to get. The, the more I like the client uh, or the more I enjoy interacting with the client, mm -hmm. um, the sooner that happens, I'll get to 50% of the project and I won't take the next step because I'm kind of like, it's like eating your dessert. I guess that's maybe that's the best way to say it, you know? You know, one thought um, on that, Kim, is if uh, looking at finishing as an, a way to actually uh, um, uh, extend the actual uh, uh, length of that relationship, because if you finish and you do a really good job, there's a really good chance that they may bring it back for more work and... If you like that client, there's a good chance that that client associates with other people that are similar to that person, right? You know, you, that would be logical. Eric. <laughs> that's a challenge. Okay. Now, if, if you have a client that's a that's a you know pain in the butt, there's a really good chance that that they're going to also associate with people who are pain in, pains yeah. in the butt, right? right. Yeah. That's so true. I mean, you know, it's, it, I think part of that is just sort of a mindset of okay, like what how can I also sort of satisfy that I want to, like, I like this person. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's that, that, that idea of we have to sort of make space for things in order to allow for, for new good things to come in. The, the challenge there is it's the uncertainty piece. Like, you know, you like this client. You don't know if the next client you're going to like so much. Yeah, there's, there's those things. It's all, you know, and going back to your point of the, uh, you made a very good point earlier. Are we doing the right job? Am I in the job that I should be doing? I mean, it's something we've struggled with for a bit for here, but um, it's, a great so question. Question. it's a great question. Scary, but great. <laughs> I have a question. I have a follow-up question for you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Have you, uh, is this, um, is your line of work one where you can create some uh, okay. follow-up? Okay. <laughs> We can't, we can't mute that one. Okay. Um, where you can create some kind of um, follow up task or process that reconnects you with that client. And it can only happen after the conclusion of that project. Like uh, in two weeks, you check back in and do X, Y, and Z. Well, the interesting part of that is, is that um, I'm trying to kill my phone as we do this here. Um, Adam, would you just kill the phone and just <laughs> take it for me? Kill it. Uh, just kill the thing. Take it away for me. <laughs> I think about having people, right? Um, the, the silly thing is, is that uh, it's a design that I finish, but then I've got anywhere from two weeks to two months sometimes of working with the client afterwards, which I really enjoy working with. So there's no logic to uh, – it's not like – it, it's going to automatically extend it, right? Oh, cool. Somewhere yeah. about finishing that last little bit of a design and – putting it I, somehow maybe it is, has more to do with presenting a not good quality project oh crap perfectionism yeah, oh my and god that could Kim, be i i know yeah. you and like mm -hmm. so it, i have had the 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 pleasure of watching kim design um uh been in his office while he's looking at like the typography maps and then it'll take this big piece of paper and just like do this like i don't even know what you would call it like it's a 30 second sketch that you just, it's just like brilliant. Like he's, mm. you connect things that I'm like, I, I wouldn't even 
think to think about it that way. And it just makes complete sense. Like when you when you lay it out in the way that you do, you know, it's it's sort of it's the um, what do they call it? The master's curse or it's like they know too much. Right. And so like, well, yeah. so what you are thinking about as quality what, versus what your customer is thinking about as quality is not even in the same state. Like, yeah. I mean, truly, because I mean, you've been doing this your whole life. And so while, while you could sketch something out in 30 seconds on a piece of paper, like that actually for a lot of situations can be a great proposal. Uh, thank you, Eric. I, I do appreciate it. And you're right. You start looking at things and you start seeing too much detail. I did that with uh, spreadsheets this morning because we're, um, we did the, uh, we're, we're do- redesigning our, or not redesigning, we're doing our, um, our annual review of our financial reports and how we're putting things together. And I look at the numbers and all of a sudden the, the numbers start speaking so much yeah. uh, that they become too complex. So it's, I don't, you're right. It's, it's part of it. But I think you're right, Eric. Just letting it go, perfectionism, um, yeah, that's all that. And, and Kim, I think, you know, you, you, I know you have some good people that work with you. Um, sharing with them this sort of this struggle and then having a, um, you know, a, a sort of a known uh, piece where you can share with them. All right, I'm at that point right now. Yeah. So, so they know exactly what that means. Right. And then the you can hand it off to, to right. the team. That and say, We got it. Yeah. Here, Kim, you're good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're right. Putting a word to it is is really a good uh, getting an articulate language. Uh, I pre- that's actually probably as valuable as anything else. You're right. Awesome. So, and Laura's doing a great job. Isn't she doing I, a great job. She's a phenomenal job. It's just it's absolutely great. Good job. Uh, we have time for a um, couple more questions, and then we are going to bring this plane in for a landing. All right, let's uh, let's kick him out. <laughs> so- um, right. Oh wait, that means let me see. Let me let me do it. No, sorry. I want to try. We'll get the next one. We'll get the next one. Sorry. <laughs> Who can I kick out? <laughs> okay. So that just sounds so fun. Um, we so Karen, if you can hear us still, um, some folks would love to know how to contact you. If you can um, post that in the chat, that would be great. Um, Okay. And then we can also we'll we will also put Karen's uh, email address uh, if, if Karen if you want that in the show notes for this episode. Um, and I could actually I think I know when this. Uh, I'm I'm usually pretty awful at knowing when this episode will air, um, but because this episode will come out the same day as our next live Q and A, um, so it'll be uh, go to the show notes. It'll be Eric Tivers dot com slash 167 um because this it'll be episode 167 and so we'll get that added to the show notes um pending that karen wants her email address uh listed there remember she'll probably well, be okay with that eric tivers say that again i was going to put it you said it too fast yeah, eric tivers dot com slash 167 so when this episode airs in a month gotcha okay. that's where the uh that contact information will be Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We have another question. I just put that in the chat. So, um, Ooh, I'm going to test my, um, my lingo awareness. How much can CBT cognitive behavioral therapy? Yes. How much can that, <laughs> I'm not saying it again, CBT affect ADHD and productivity? Is it realistic to think that we can use those cognitive behavioral techniques to drive ourselves to getting things done? That is from Kat. Okay, great, great question. Yes, and I think one of the, the um, w- with anything, you know, there's no silver bullet. There's no, I just use this one approach. That's going to be the thing that's going to, you know, help me make all the progress that I want to make. It's a combination of things. I think that um, uh, CBT can be very helpful um, when you're dealing with sort of cognitive distortions. And what that means is so, um, you know, so CBT, what, it, what the essence of what it does is it helps you sort of identify the thoughts that you're having because um, our thoughts lead to feelings that we have. And it is those feelings or those emotions that we're having about something that drive our behaviors, okay? And so often in CBT, what we look at is identifying 
those uh, cognitive distortions. So those those thoughts that we have that maybe aren't actually based fully in reality when we compare it to um, uh, how we actually do things. You know, common examples of uh, well, this will just take five minutes, right? It's like how long have we been telling ourselves that, and how many times is that thing actually taking us five minutes, right? So with that though, we also have to understand that that with with ADHD, ADHD is not necessarily i mean it's not a a a thinking problem right like a lot of it is we know what to do but we don't do what we know so we have to really focus on more of the behavioral uh piece of this uh, i wish i can um cite who uh, I, I was at a chat conference a couple of years ago um and i, I don't remember who i heard uh, talk about this but it was a, a clinician talking about how she likes to call it uh, uh, behavioral cognitive therapy because it's the behaviors, it's the actions that really need to be the focus. Um, and then the thoughts will sort of follow and then it reinforces that emotional piece and then that cycle sort of continues. Um, I think CBT is really powerful when you're dealing with shame and perfectionism. Um, I think it's really powerful if we're dealing with uh, anxiety and, and overwhelm. Um, so it's... Being really clear about what the things that are getting in your way uh, is, is really helpful for for um, uh, helping with ADHD using CBT. I'm a very CBT oriented um, uh, coach and clinician, um, and so uh, I think the question: is What is it that you're trying to sort of address? Um, because the behavioral piece is just as important as sort of the cognitive piece, um, but like all things depends. It depends on who you are. It depends on your background, your life circumstance, the context that uh, that you're dealing um, with this stuff in. Um, but I just think it's important to sort of have a, a uh, uh, an accurate or honest self-assessment with everything we're doing. And that, uh, you know, the, the, the CBT piece can be really helpful for that. Looking at the the, um, the things that you tell yourself that you should be doing, we call those the shouldy thoughts. Um, you know, it's sort of re- reframing some of these things. Um, so instead of saying, oh, I should be able to handle that, reframe that as it would be nice if I did that, right? It's a, it's a little bit of a shift in, in the language that we use, but language matters on how, on how we feel with things. Um, you know, and so another piece of CBT is to be able to to assess how strongly you're feeling a specific emotion um, and then to reappraise the situation if you could look at it in another way and then to reassess the emotion, how strong it is after a, a healthier sort of reappraisal um, of that emotion. Um, so again, it, it just depends on sort of what the specifics are. But yes, CBT is an evidence-based um, uh, treatment. So. That was a sort of a, uh, to use Karen's uh, thing, an associational response to, I think, that question. Or I call it a somewhat tangential response to that question where I was just hitting different pieces of CBT. Made sense to me. Ho- hopefully that helps, Kat. And um, we are at time. We oh. are at time. So We're a little bit past time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just want to thank everybody uh, who who asked a question. And as as we're Here wrapping up, we see that Craig just came in with a, with a book um, of a question, um, a full full paragraph. Um, yeah. What we will try to do is we will uh, we'll we'll um, uh, answer that question. Um, um, I don't know. I'm not going to overcommit to something. So I'm going to just scratch that thought um, and just say thank you. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the 95%, right? It's like I want to keep it going because I'm enjoying this. But it's, yeah. you know, we're going we're gonna to bring it in uh, for a landing. Um, I do want to share one thing because I think that I shared this during the last Q&A that we did. Uh, I was talking about how, uh, um, and I mentioned this on, on the number of past podcasts, um, how I needed to hire a, a VA, a virtual assistant. And this has sort of been one of those like goals that I've had for a very, very long time. And, uh, and when I did the beginning of my year planning, I identified that this uh, hiring a VA was going to be the one thing. And if you guys have heard me talk about the idea of the one thing, it's like, what's that one thing that you will, that you could do uh, that if you did it would make everything else easier or unnecessary. This comes from the book, the one thing. 
Um, and my one thing was to hire a VA. Um, and so we're recording this on April 11th. Um, and I am super excited to announce that officially, as of this morning, contracts have been you signed did it. and I hired a VA. <laughs> So I'm if really anybody excited. Anybody ever about needed that. it? It's you, Eric. Good gracious. Okay, congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, just wanted to share that because that's that's just kind of exciting. Um, and um, so I want to leave you with this question: What's what's your one thing that if you did that one thing would make everything else easier or potentially unnecessary? Thank you so much for joining us live and for listening uh, to the podcast. Um, hope you'll join us next month for our next live Q and A. Um, and I just want to say thanks to everybody. And Laura, you did wonderful. Thank you. Thank did you. It, everyone who's here, give, give a, a hands up, a round of applause to, to Laura for, for jumping in here. Oh, you, stop it. Like a boss, wow. you handled it. <laughs> Thanks. I did put my bossy pants on just for this. So. <laughs> I'm wearing them. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, everyone, Eric. so much. And we'll catch you next month. Hi. Bye. Bye. This has been Eric Tivers, and I want to thank you for listening and congratulations. You made it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning growing and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find additional summaries and resources for each episode, learn more about the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group, and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. You want to see interviews with content not heard on the podcast? Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. Don't just be a passive listener. Be an active member of the community. Submit your request to join our free and growing community on Facebook. Watch your message inbox. You will get a message either from myself or Nisha Subramanian. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, and clients. If you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, tell them about this show. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really love this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the word and get this message out there. One of the biggest things that you really can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? You could start with Brene Brown's The Gifts of Imperfections or her six-hour recorded workshop, The Power of Vulnerability. If you've already listened to those, then you might want to move on to Daring Greatly or her most recent book, Rising Strong. This is Eric Tivers, and I want to leave you with a question. Do you stay up late to finish work so you only sleep for five hours and then the next day you have trouble focusing so you stay up late to finish work? If so, you might be in the ADHD productivity sleep cycle. Try this instead. Go to sleep. Get an accountability partner to check in with about your sleep time. Get more sleep. Get more done. Thanks for listening. Until next time.